Good morning, and thank you all for being here. Imagine for a moment that you had a special software on your computer that exposed many of the files on your hard drive to searches by other people. At any time your computer is connected to the Internet, other computer users with similar software could simply search your hard drive and copy unprotected files. Unfortunately, that is a sad reality for many unsuspecting computer users. Peer-to-peer file-sharing software like LimeWire works in just that way. Most people who use peer-to-peer -peer software do it to download music and movies over the Internet. And most people who use it are totally unaware that they are, may expose some of the most private files on their computers to being downloaded by others. Nine years ago, this committee first held a hearing that revealed that government commercial and private information was being stolen by peer-to-peer file-sharing networks, unbeknowing to the users. In response to congressional pressure, the file-sharing software industry agreed to regulate itself, implementing a code of conduct to address inadvertent file-sharing. The efforts failed. Two years ago, at our July 24, 2007 hearing, LimeWire's CEO, Mark Gorton, expressed surprise that sensitive personal information was available through LimeWire. He pledged to address the problem. That effort failed. Over the last year alone, there have been several reports of major security and privacy breaches involving LimeWire, information about electronics for the President's Marine One helicopter, and financial information belonging to Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer were leaked on LimeWire. LimeWire does not deny those reports, but claims that recent changes to the software prevents inadvertent file sharing. To investigate LimeWire's assertion, the committee staff downloaded and explored LimeWire's software. The staff found copyrighted music and movies, federal tax returns, government files, medical records, and many other sensitive documents on the LimeWire network. Security experts from Tyversa found major problems. Specific examples of recent LimeWire leaks range from appalling to shocking. The Social Security numbers and family information for every master sergeant in the Army had been found on LimeWire. The medical records of some 24,000 patients of a Texas hospital were inadvertently released, and most of the files are still available on LimeWire. FBI files, including surveillance photos of an alleged mafia hitman, were leaked while he was on trial and before he was convicted. We were astonished to discover that a security breach involving the Secret Service resulted in the leak of a file on LimeWire containing a safe house location for the first family. As far as I'm concerned, the days of self-regulation should be over for the filing, file sharing industry. In the last administration, the Federal Trade Commission took a see no evil, hear no evil approach to file sharing software industry. I hope the new administration is revisiting that approach, and I hope to work with them on how to better protect the privacy of consumers. Today, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on the impact of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, and in particular, how LimeWire proposes to help remedy the problems caused by its software. <clears throat> I now yield five minutes to the ranking member, Congressman Darrell Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think as both of us are saying in various ways, today is clearly deja vu all over again. Two years ago, July 2007, this committee brought to light in a vivid 
but e altogether too easy to demonstrate demonstration that, in fact, over this peer-to-peer -peer network, by design, or at least by knowing and allowing, unwitted share, un unwitting sharing of personal information over this peer-to-peer -peer was, in fact, not just going on, but well-known and going on in a rampant way. I remember all too well the details of the, the documents, including Social Security number, of a soldier with the 101st Airborne and his colleagues. Those Social Security numbers were there for everyone. Name, rank, Social Security number, date and place of birth, and of course, anything and everything one would need to capture his identity and his colleagues. It's very clear that little has changed. In preparation for this hearing, we noted that there was a brand new version, a version that in fact at least went part of the way toward protecting inadvertent uh, loss of documents. But I say part of the way because, as you can imagine, in the world of the Internet, we assume that you are protected unless you give up those protections. Not so of, true of this software. This software required essentially for copyrighted works that you opt in to, in fact, protecting software rather than have to knowingly uh, make copyrighted software available. You simply don't check and never again will we have to worry about your, cop uh, your copy or someone else's copyrighted software being available to everyone. The zip files of names, addresses, social security numbers, income tax returns, still once again showing from California, showing that in fact today loading the current software, I should more accurately say yesterday, my staff never having worked it before with a brand new computer downloaded the latest software and in fact went sightseeing to find exactly what you might find. An engineer who only made about $37,000 took a standard deduction and in fact uh, his information, all of it is available. Mr. Chairman, identity theft should be at the heart of our concern. I'm personally on, on the Judiciary Committee and I'm concerned about the copyrighted software, the hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of dollars that are being stolen through peer-to-peer -peer tra transaction. But I think when we look at the, the most important thing for the American people, we are in fact if we do not close once and for all in no uncertain terms the loophole that allows people's in individual and sensitive information, company information, employee information to be inadvertently and thoroughly dispersed in a way that leads without a doubt to PayPal registration, to MasterCard registration, and in fact to the ruining of their credit and their lives. Mr. Chairman, there is no question We've come not far enough in two years. I know that this hearing will shed more light on it, but I will tell you this desk, disc, Mr. Chairman, to me represents a referral to the AG and a referral to California's Attorney General if we cannot be satisfied in no uncertain terms that we have reached the end of this kind of activity because otherwise, as we say too often on this committee but appropriately here, if in fact you condone, allow, and induce this to happen, you are guilty of cooperation and participation in every criminal act that flows from the discovery of that information. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to have the rest of my record, my opening statement placed in the record and yield back the balance of my time. Without objection. It is longstanding policy that we swear in all of our witnesses, so will you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that they... Mr. Robert Boback is the Chief Executive Officer of Tyversa, Inc. Mr. Boback will conduct a demonstration of the dangerous uses and activities of LimeWire that Tyversa has uncovered through the monitoring technology 
and work with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Let me welcome you, Mr. Boback, and we're now prepared to... Um, Thank you, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa and distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to testify here today. As the Chairman mentioned, my name is Robert Boback, and I am the CEO of Tyversa. What we're about to show you is information that is current. This is all within the last few months of disclosures that have not been publicly released. So this information you, you most likely haven't, haven't seen prior. But as Ranking Member Issa points out, identity theft is going to be at the core of this. And you will see that despite uh, uh, the, the you know, regulations uh, around identity theft, that the FTC has not addressed this fully. In fact, identity theft, peer-to-peer -peer is not even mentioned on the identity theft website of the FTC for victims of the nine million victims. And you will find that this is where identity theft is occurring. This is the harvest grounds. This is why your consumers will say, I do not know where it happened. I don't know how identity theft happened. And we're gonna show you a demonstration of just that fact. And they affect every district. There are millions and millions of individuals that are affected. So if we could start through the demonstration. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, highlight this in a number of issues. The first one, of, of course, is the national security implications, of which there are many, many. What we're starting here is these are just some of the files, excerpts from some of the files. They've been redacted. These are all military troops, hundreds of thousands of troops, social security numbers, different rosters, different information from around the world with their next of kin, their children's names, their socials, their dates of birth, as Ranking Member Issa pointed out. Again, it goes on and on and on. And these are all current. They are still all available, by the way, on the peer-to-peer. -peer. And if we could go on to the next one. This, as, as pointed out in the opening statement of, of the chairman, this is the safe house route for the United States Secret Service when they have to evacuate the, the First Lady in this case. This is found on the peer-to-peer. -peer. This is the location. I don't know how much the United States government spends in preparing a safe house location, but I presume it's pretty expensive. And all of that is lost based on this information being disclosed. So now the safe house has to be moved. The, the locations have to be moved. We, of course, redacted all of this so that uh, uh, in order to protect uh, what, what is left of the, of the security of this. Some of the other information, the motorcade route, and the next one, Sam. And as you can see, this was a breach just as of yesterday. Or excuse, it, we found this yesterday, but as you can see from the date, July 5th, 2009, this is the entire United States nuclear information. All of our facilities, everything. This is from the United States. This is from the president. With the president's information listed on here, every nuclear facility and all the secure, highly confidential, as you can read on the top, highly confidential, safeguard, sensitive. Every nuclear agency, every facility. The problem is, we found this in France. Four locations in France, not in the United States. This information, other countries know how to access this information, and they are accessing this information. And this was, as, as you can see, as the date, if we push on to the next slide, this was the cover letter on it, right from the President of the United States with our President Barack Obama's signature at the end, with his uh, writing at the end. This is not even subject to a FOIA request. So therefore, so you couldn't get this information on a Freedom of Information Act. However, you can access it on the peer-to-peer -peer in free open text. Just uh, it doesn't make sense. Switching over to an issue, again, identity theft. Medical identity theft is hugely on the rise. This information, people understand that they're, they're looking for credit card information. I get that. But uh, I don't look at my explanation of benefits from my insurance provider like I look at my credit card statement. I will tell you that you should because the identity thieves will. A uh, medical insurance card is like a, a visa card with a thousand, or excuse me, a million dollar spending limit. They will buy online drugs, Oxycontin, Viagra, and by the time you go to the doctor next time, all of a sudden the doctor has you listed as an as a Oxycontin addict, and you've never taken it in your life. This is the problem. This information has come out of a hospital, as you mentioned, in, this, in a southern state. And, you know, so individuals that will say, I don't even use peer-to-peer. -peer. I've never downloaded a thing. I'm safe, right? Well, have you ever been to the emergency room? Because you just might not be safe. And that's exactly what happened to these 20-some thousand individuals. All they did was go to the doctor. 
and they provided their information as they should to their facility for the insurance billing and a billing company uh, that someone was listening to music while they were typing in their data entry and what ended up happening 24,000 victims are affected in this specific case we informed the company this actually occurred this was the only one that occurred over a year ago it occurred over a year ago and we have informed through our client which was a large insurance carrier this com we told the hospital that this was disclosed and unfortunately they said it's not my problem it's not my problem I don't want to I don't want to go out publicly and say that I disclosed 24,000 individuals what you'll see is that there's a House Bill 2221. 2221 provides for a national uh, breach notification. It's long overdue. 41 of the 50 states have breach notification and they vary in their severity. This hospital is a clear case. Although the state of Texas does have a breach notification law, this hospital is in direct violation of it. They've known about this for over a year. They haven't even told these victims that they're victims. So these people have been the victims of identity theft. The hospital is clearly negligent for, for handling this information in the way that they have. But this is what you see the pattern. No one wants to say, gosh, I've been the victim of, I've, I've had a data breach and it's my responsibility to address it. So there needs to be legislation in order to force companies to say, do the right thing. You would hope that they would do it without, without the pressing. Information, back up one, Sam, please. This is a Midwest-based HIV clinic. Our most sensitive information, these are AIDS victims. 184 patients, victims of identity theft. The clinic released their information and has not addressed it. And this information is still out there. This is everything you need as an identity thief. Why would you ever dive in a dumpster, as the FTC calls out as the number one reason where people get it? I can get 184 just from this one file and thousands from the other files. As we continue on, major pharmaceutical company, information, all of their research, everyone where they're going, it affects even the most robust security measures, which what we're seeing. All of these companies have firewalls and antivirus and intrusion detection, and intrusion prevention, but yet an encryption, where's the security? There isn't any. They don't address it because the awareness, they say, I, you know, we don't, we don't allow downloading of peer-to-peer, -peer, or that's a recording industry problem. No, in fact, it's their problem. And companies need to do this. Just as when antivirus started out, it was unheard of at, at the beginning, and then it evolved to where that's how security and technology evolves. So therefore, this information's out. Numerous doctors, if you've ever gone to a doctor, your complete patient records, everything, your, your soap notes, if you will, they're all out there as well. And continuing on, behavioral health information. Again, all with social security numbers. Everything we're showing you is a social security number in here. And continue on. This is one, if you've ever had, if you've ever gone to uh, the uh, drugstore and, and, buy, uh, and were buying Sudafed, you're required to give your driver's license information because they keep track of that for methamphetamine labs. The problem, though, remains that you now gave your driver's license information to buy Sudafed because you had a cold, and now you could be the victim of identity theft with individuals with driver's licenses around the nation because that information may or may not have been secured. And if it's not secured, as this one wasn't, you're now exposed. And you're exposed forever. And they may not even tell you when they find out. There's a serious issue. And then moving on from there, here's an interesting uh, example for corporations nationwide. This is an enormous uh, organization that all of you have heard of. Unfortunately, we can't give the name in an open environment because this is a publicly traded company that is very well known uh, in the Fortune 500. This individual is an M&A executive, the mergers and acquisition executive that handles all the M&A activity for, for the organization. In doing that, they were using peer-to-peer -peer and exposed a file called a PST file. A PST file is your archive of your emails. It is you. Imagine someone being able to open up your Outlook and read every email that you sent and open every attachment and also open your calendar and see what conference calls you have, the dial-in numbers, the passcodes, because that's in fact what happened in this case. This is, I'm sure that the SEC would have an interest in looking at companies that, that do this and have this information because not only is the emails, are the emails on there, but they also have the attachments of every acquisition that this company is going to make. The ranges of which they're willing to pay for these. And as the next slide will show, it also has the financial information 
all the way listed through the third quarter, as you can see, third quarter 2009. Now, this, if you were an investor, there's market manipulation that could happen from here because I know the internal financials of what the company's going to do for the next three months or six months. I know what the stock's going to do because I see your financials. This information has to be protected. Again, they use state-of-the-art, spend millions of dollars on their security, and yet this is still a problem. So then also going forward, other financial institutions, it's not just that. There's other financial institutions with thousands, 5,000 entries of, of client information, exposures on um, mortgage information here in the next file, 12,000 credit card numbers, again, identity theft, and continuing on, as the chairman mentioned, these are photos, and we've redacted the photos to, to protect this. This is the organized crime case that we were talking about. These are the surveillance photos of an organized crime. This is a murder trial. And these photos were disclosed while the trial was on, in, in process. There was no conviction before this. So therefore, whether who, who disclosed them, we still haven't investigated yet. But this was just found. So this is literally uh, the individual in the, in the photos here is actually behind bars now on a life sentence. But this was disclosed while he was on trial. And again, on the right-hand side, Sam, if you could jump up one. In a, obviously an organized crime case, you don't want to disclose the government witness list for obvious reasons. As you can see on the right-hand side, we blurred it out so that you can't see the names. That is the entire confidential government witness list in an organized crime case. Many of these people are in the witness protection program. There's their information. This is not what you want to have out there. Next slide. So as we continue on, we grabbed, as Ranking Member Issa mentioned, there are tax returns from all over, Brooklyn, Arizona, Massachusetts, Maryland, Vermont. We could have gone on through all the 50 states and had thousands of them from any of these 50 states. This is where identity theft is happening, and it's not out there. This is where it's happening. If you've been the victim of identity theft, think peer-to-peer, because -peer, that's where it happened. And you didn't lose your purse or wallet, think peer-to-peer, because -peer, that's where it happened. As we go on, Sam, the, we're going to show a video, not on that one yet, we're going to do the tax return video. I want to show you using LimeWire, now Tyversa has technology that allows us to see out the entire network. We're going to use a LimeWire, we did a LimeWire video here, just to show you how easy it is for individuals to, to uh, gain access to tax return information. So using LimeWire Pro here, we typed in tax return, there's five, five connections that you're connected to. We use this because people say, ah, well, you have fancy technology, and that's the only reason you can gain access to this. No, it's not. He typed in tax return. There's only five connections, so it's not, you know, it's not even widely connected. And as you can see, it's small on the screen. There are just hundreds of tax returns coming in. It's not using our technology. So as you can see, it's this simple, and this is in real time. So click on any, you can click on any of those tax returns. That, that function he used was a browse host function. And again, this software is still out there. Download the tax return, and literally within minutes, as you're going to see here, it's downloading a couple tax returns, and we're going to show you just how easy, as this, as this loads in, here they're coming in at the bottom there. So as we click on those, you're going to see that this individual used H&R Block. No, it's not a problem with H&R Block. That's just, that's just who they used. And they saved a copy of it. That person used tax, TurboTax. And as you can see, there's their social security numbers. There's their children's social security numbers. It's that simple. Why would you ever dumpster die? It's right there. That's not our technology. That's theirs. Um, it's that information. So Sam switching to uh, Info Concentrator. We'll show you that individuals do this. We call them information concentrators or identity thieves. This individual right here is an individual in Arizona and if you could see all the files that they have, this individual does exactly what I just showed you. He's collecting tax return files to sell them on the black market. And we're working with the FBI to address this right now. And this is an uh, investigation here. This individual has 1,800. As you can see how small that is. He's just scrolling through all of those tax returns. All of those victims are identity theft victims. They're all going to be victims of identity theft if they haven't already, many of which have already been victims of identity theft. But as you know, my social security number has been my social security number for 38 years, and it will continue to be so. So maybe I just, I'll wait, you know, if I have your, if someone has mine, maybe they'll wait a year or two years. Then they'll do a thing like file my tax return for me. Yeah, that's right. That's the new identity theft. I'll file your tax return for you in January. 
in January taking your return. I'll steal your return because no amount of monitoring, nothing's going to stop me. I'll take the return. The United States government, the Treasury pays that money. And when working with the IRS, they told us that that is $20 billion a year that costs the United States Treasury. $20 billion a year of individuals filing someone else's tax return and stealing the refund. This is what's going down, and this is how it's happening. This is how they gain access to the information. So, and again, one just to close it all up, showing the Eagle Vision. Our software, I'm going to show you our software running here. And it actually hits even closer to home as a parent of three daughters. These are, we can't even show this all because of the nature of it. This is our software running live right now. And every one of those little, little blips along the bottom there, those red little blips on the screen, every one of those is an individual that's either a child predator or child pornographer happening live right now that is taking information, child pornography. That is only child pornography. Four-year-old, five-year-old. And what they do is, and you can see the searches as we, they go by. These are individual searches happening right now. This is live right this second. All of those little red blips, every one of those was a child pornographer. Again, felony possession, five years. You can't even possess it. But they're not afraid on peer-to-peer -peer because they know security can't catch them. So this is what's happening. And behind that, Sam flipped to the screen. This is an individual, and we had to black it. This is a famous NASCAR driver. He's very well known. That's why I didn't want to show his face. That's an innocent picture of him with his son. There's nothing wrong with this. We found this picture in an investigation with the FBI in the hands of a child pornographer. And here's what they do. They take your picture, which you may have on your computer, and they'll take it off of your computer. And they will put that innocent little boy, the son of the NASCAR driver, they'll put his picture in amongst the pictures of indecent pictures. Because what it will do is it will take law enforcement, and they'll think that it's that person because they'll only show midsections of the, of the indecent pictures. But once they show a face, obviously law enforcement's going to deduce that that is the face of the victim. And in an effort to try to find the victim, it actually turns you the wrong direction. But the problem is, is imagine if this NASCAR driver were the, you know, a potential victim in a, in a sexually explicit case. It could ruin his career, and he didn't do anything wrong. His daughter downloaded a peer-to-peer -peer client had it on her system, and she had a picture of her dad and her brother. Nothing bad, and this is what happens. So again, in closing, I'd like to say that recommendations that we say, clearly there's a problem. There are a number of recommendations. Obviously, a number of government agencies are disclosing information across the board. Why they are not monitoring for this information, this would be like a bank shutting off the security cameras and saying, oh, my vault's safe enough. I don't need to worry about watching it. It doesn't make sense. All government agencies should monitor for this information. You can't disclose this. We can't be the victim. These military individuals were, were d disclosed by the military. You can't have that. You know, we saw the press that it got when the body armor wasn't approved. Imagine these, these troops fighting. You know, they're trying to stay off of an IED. They don't want to check their credit. They're not doing that. They're coming home, and they're being victims of identity theft, and they're further victimized from this. Can't have that happen. There is legislation with 2221 that should be out there to give the FTC power to do this. As of now, they, they don't have the extensive power that they need. DSS, the Defense Security Service, I'll close up, DSS should, should again look for the defense contractors that are disclosing information. The SEC should look and the FTC should also be engaged in changing their website to do that. So again, I apologize. I know I was over time. So, sir, I'll concede back. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Mr. Bobak. Uh, Mr. Gordon is the chairman of Lime Group and founder of the world's most popular peer-to-peer -peer software called LimeWire. Um, Mr. Gordon, we will give you, um, f well, actually, I'll give you 10 minutes to respond. Um, <clears throat> OK. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa. Um, my name is Mark Gorton, and I am the founder and chairman of LimeWire LLC. I am happy to be able to report that since the July 24, 2000 hearing on inadvertent file sharing, LimeWire has made great progress addressing inadvertent file sharing. And with the most recent versions of the LimeWire application, the problem of inadvertent file sharing for LimeWire, for current LimeWire users, has been eliminated. The LimeWire team has put a huge amount of effort into resolving this problem. We have redesigned and re-engineered the entire user interface for the application. This has been a large task, 
and our efforts have proved worthwhile. The current version of LimeWire does not share any documents by default. In order for a LimeWire user to change their default settings to enable document sharing, they have to click nine times and disregard three warnings. Even then, if a user shares a folder, LimeWire will, LimeWire will not share the documents in that folder. In LimeWire 5, there are no shared folders, meaning that if a user elects to share a folder, they are only electing to share the contents of that folder at that particular time. Nothing will be shared that a user adds to that folder at a later point in time. All LimeWire versions 5 and above automatically unshare documents that a user may have shared using an earlier version of LimeWire 4. I am confident with the recent versions of LimeWire, all sharing is intentional sharing. From the vast improvements that LimeWire has made on the front of inadvertent file sharing, I hope that the members of this committee can see that LimeWire is sincere and dedicated to working with this committee. In, to, in addition to this committee, LimeWire has successfully worked with the FBI, the New York State Attorney General's Office, and the FTC on a range of issues surrounding, surrounding P2P file sharing. Unfortunately, the popular perception of LimeWire regarding inadvertent file sharing fails to match LimeWire's excellent record in addressing these pro problems. A good part of this misperception is due to the highly inaccurate and misleading report produced by Tom Sindor of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Mr. Sindor's report is deceptive and filled with factual errors and misleading statements. The number of issues with Mr. Sindor's report is too large for me to cover in my summary statement, so for the benefit of this committee, I have submitted a detailed critique of Mr. Sindor's report in my written statement. Um, it, it's probably worth me pointing out um, a little, going a little bit into the technical detail of the way file sharing networks work so people can understand the relationship of LimeWire to um, the uh, um, file sharing networks in the world. LimeWire, the application, speaks a protocol called Nutella. Um, this is similar. There are, there are many common internet, internet protocols. There are the email protocols, the World Wide Web protocols, FTP protocols. And using these open protocols, many applications that speak these protocols are capable of communicating with each other. So by using LimeWire, you are capable of communicating with dozens of applications that speak compatible protocols. So when you do a search with LimeWire, you're not just talking to other LimeWire programs in the world. You're talking to dozens of other different types of programs, um, most of which are produced outside the United States. So um, it's important to keep in mind that even though you, are, you might actually be using LimeWire, you, the results that you get with LimeWire don't necessarily come from another LimeWire client. Um, similar, it, it's somewhat analogous to on the World Wide Web, you have Internet Explorer, you have Safari, um, you have Firefox, and using each of those applications, you, you can access a website, but the, the website that is, um, that is being seen does not have anything, may not have anything to do with those particular applications. Um, it's, um, again, I, I, as it, it is certainly true that in the past, LimeWire has had issues with inadvertent file sharing, and we work very hard to address those issues. Um, I'd like to point out that using the recent versions of LimeWire, um, it would have been very difficult for any individual to share any of the documents that Mr. Bobek um, has shown us recently. So um, I, I do understand that inadvertent file sharing is a problem in this world. LimeWire is committed to help addressing it, but LimeWire is one company um, in a field where there are hundreds of P2P applications in this world, and we are doing our best to set a standard that we hope other file sharing companies can follow. But most of these, uh, the creators of file sharing applications are not based in the United States. They may not even be corporations. Um, so I think it's important for the committee to understand when they are considering regulations in, the, in this regard, um, the, the somewhat complicated nature of peer-to-peer -peer networks in the world. Um, in addition to inadvertent file sharing, um, I, I think there are a couple other issues I'd like to at least cover in my opening statements and, and, and potentially in the um, question period. Um, I'd like to point out that LimeWire has been working to build a collaborative relationship with the recording industry. Um, LimeWire has built a store for digital 
uh, media at store.limewire.com, which currently has over 3.5 million MP3s available for purchase. In addition, LimeWire is actively building an advertising solution to allow participating content holders to profit from advertising related to their, to their media. Many of the very most senior people in the music industry support working constructively with LimeWire, but building an industry-wide consensus on a policy change regarding P2P has been a slow and grueling process. After many meetings with record industry executives, I am convinced that the industry recognizes the benefits of embracing P2P in order to stay relevant going forward. I would also like to take this opportunity to discuss the current regulatory environment surrounding copyright and the Internet. The history of copyright regulation is one where new technologies have created issues for the old regulatory system, and then the new regulatory system was updated to take into account the abilities of these new technologies. The Internet has transformed media distribution and consumption, yet copyright regulation is yet to be updated to account for the new capabilities of digital technologies. The current lack of practical copyright enforcement mechanisms has put the recording industry in the unfortunate position of being pitted against its customers and technology companies. As a technologist, I have a good sense of the range of technical possibilities available to regulators as they consider updating regulations surrounding the Internet. The Internet is not unpoliceable. With determined targeted regulation, almost any level of control of the Internet is possible. And as Mr. Bobek has shown, technology can play a role in this. The fact is, using and leveraging technology, law enforcement officials can, you know, with one person, monitor millions and millions of computers. And a lot of the behavior that is currently going on with a little bit of technology probably can be um, remedied fairly quickly. I, I think law enforcement has been a little bit behind the curve in using technology uh, to police the Internet. And, and in addition to um, simply law enforcement, um, it, it's also worth keeping in mind on the, um, on the I guess, judiciary side on the, on the, that currently the procedural overhead in dealing with crime that occurs on the Internet it's, it's very time-consuming and difficult to, to address these problems, and I'm sure Mr. Bobek can, can testify to that, in terms of what it takes to, you know, contact the FBI, um, to get files taken down, and, and, and things like that. Um, it is possible to set up enforcement mechanisms that are, that are nearly automated. Um, and if we were to have a proper enforcement regime out there, it would be possible to simply um, address many of these problems. I, I think it's very important to keep in mind of the need to address the problems at the root point of control. So every computer on the Internet is connected through an Internet service provider. That is a unique point of control for that single computer. And that Internet service provider can, um, you know, cut off, that, um, cut off access to, to, a, to any offending computer. And I understand that when addressing these issues, um, you know, people use LimeWire. It, it's the superficial interface to all of these problems. Um, but I think, as you're, as you're well aware, um, I mean, LimeWire is now the most popular peer-to-peer -peer file sharing application. It hasn't always been that way. I mean, there's, there's a list of file sharing applications that have uh, come before LimeWire, certainly. You know, I'm sure you, you know, Napster and Kazaa and Morpheus and BearShare and iMesh. I mean, there, there, there's, there's quite a long list. And most of the regulatory efforts and or perhaps not, you know, prosecutorial efforts on, on, on the part of the, the recording industry have focused on um, file sharing applications. But those file sharing applications, um, it, they're, they're by no means a unique point of control. Consumers have the ability to switch between them very, very simply. And so I, I think when people are considering regulation, it's very important to consider the, the effects of, the, of that regulation. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. Um, Mr. Sidnor is Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for the Study of Digital Property the Progress and Freedom Foundation. He will testify about issues discussed in the recently published paper entitled Inadvertent File Sharing Reinvented the Dangerous Design of Lime Wire. Mr. Sidnor. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member uh, Issa, and uh, honorable members of the committee. I thank all of you for holding this, the third, committee's third hearing on inadvertent file sharing. Um, I note in his written testimony, Mr. Gordon has said that two years ago, after the last hearing, LimeWire began the process that culminated in all but eliminating inadvertent sh file sharing with the LimeWire application. Uh, recent media reports from, for example, Today Investigates, as well as Mr. Bobak's testimony makes clear that statement is simply not true. Uh, my, in my testimony today, I hope to explain a little bit about why. Um, the essential question, I think, in this hearing is, uh, is, is as uh, I think the ranking member phrased it, is this deja vu all over again? After the committee's 2003 hearing identified two features in file sharing programs uh, that uh, had been shown to cause users, to cause what I would call catastrophic inadvertent file sharing, that is users to share thousands of personal files that clearly no one would ever want to share over the Nutella file sharing network. Um, after that he hearing highlighted the dangers of those features, uh, LimeWire worked with its then trade association, Peer to Peer United, to develop a code of conduct that would have prohibited it, uh, their use. Um, so uh, it looked as if the problem was solved. But what actually happened is that LimeWire went out and actually systematically disregarded that code of conduct and incorporated both of those features into its program. Uh, as a result, um, LimeWire found itself starring in many of the high-profile incidents of catastrophic and inadvertent file sharing. Uh, and the question is now, in the aftermath of the committee's 2007 hearing, uh, LimeWire found a new trade association, the, digital, the uh, Distributed Computing, uh, Computer Industry Association, worked with it to promulgate a new set of industry self-regulations, uh, which um, it allegedly implemented in the versions of its program it called LimeWire 5. Uh, provided compliance data that led its trade association to deem it the poster child for compliance with those um, voluntary best practices. Uh, and the question is, well, you know, this time it, uh, it, um, has LimeWire actually uh, done what it claimed it would do? Uh, in my uh, report, the uh, um, inadvertent file sharing reinvented dangerous design of LimeWire 5, the answer is clearly no, it has not. Uh, and nothing that has happened since the release of that report changes that conclusion. Essentially, my report identified three fundamental problems in the versions of, uh, recent versions of LimeWire that we could call LimeWire 5.1. Uh, first, uh, these p programs are dangerously unpredictable. The simple truth of the matter is Mr. Gordon says his program won't uh, uh, share document files by default. If you will look in my written testimony, you will find a screenshot taken this weekend on a test computer that was set up to look exactly like my, per my, my personal computer at home, my main home computer, which is to say that it had uh, 16,798 document, image, video, and audio files stored in subfolders of its My Document folder. I completed a default on this test computer. There was no version of LimeWire uh, presently installed, and I completed a default installation, just as Mr. De Gordon described in his 2007 testimony. Click next, 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 all the way through the process. The result was 16,798 files shared, by, including document files, shared by default simply by installing the program. That is an entirely unacceptable result. That is LimeWire 5. The truth of the matter is, if you install this program, if any normal computer uses installs this program on an ordinary home computer, they have no way to know what will do, will do to them by default. Um, so it is dangerously unpredictable. And it is dangerously unpredictable because LimeWire has failed to correct the causes of that dangerous unpredictability that have been disclosed to it for years. Second fundamental problem, uh, it, I, it, it manifests at least eight violations of the voluntary best practices that it supposedly implements. These are not technical violations. These are violations of the key substantive requirements. Eight, it is take. LimeWire appears to be taking voluntary self-regulation no more seriously in 2009 than it did in 2003. Finally, the design of LimeWire 5.1 was not just dangerous, but knowingly dangerous. Uh, LimeWire, what LimeWire uh, told the committee in a, in a letter dated July, uh, May 1st, 2009, 
is that it had eliminated the problem of uh, inadvertent, catastrophic, at least inadvertent file sharing, inadvertent sharing of sensitive files by eliminating from its, uh, from its program something it called uh, recursive sharing of folders. Or, uh, this means that if you selected a folder to be shared, not only you, would you share that folder, the files in that folder, you would share all the files in all of its subfolders. And this design is indeed extremely dangerous. It enables one mistake to result in the sharing of literally thousands of files, of personal files, all your documents, all your, home fo all your family photos, all your scanned documents, all your home movies, and your entire music collection. If that happens, you are set up for at least three forms of financial ruin. Uh, you can lose your job, identity theft, you can be sued for copyright infringement. Devastating results from virtually every type of file you'd be sharing. Um, we can and, you summarize, Mr. Sidno. Pardon me? Could you summarize? Certainly. The, the short of it is, um, LimeWire knew that LimeWire's own website de design proves that it knew that this design was dangerous. Has it corrected it in LimeWire 5.2.8? No. What it did was to take out the dangerous feature that I identified in LimeWire 5.1 and reinsert an old dangerous feature, recursive sharing of folders. Mr. Uh, Gordon's uh, written testimony tells you that there are three ways to share files in the most recent version of this program. That's wrong. There are four. The fourth way is to click the uh, Add Files button uh, revealed in his own screenshots where you will once again be recursively sharing folders, the very feature that Mr. Gordon and his trade association told this committee and other committees was the cause of catastrophic inadvertent file sharing. We are not still, years later, not witnessing good faith behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me thank uh, all of you for your tes testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may, may I make a brief comment? Yeah, we, you will have an opportunity. Okay. Oh, yeah. We, you have an opportunity. Uh, Mr. Gordon, uh, the latest edition of LimeWire came out just last week. Are you telling us that the latest edition of LimeWire prevents unintentional file sharing? Um, I mean, it... it I believe in most all cases it, it prevents unintentional file sharing. And, and if I may briefly comment on uh, Mr. Sindor's statement, because he, he, may, he tells a story of installing LimeWire on a computer that has no LimeWire currently installed on it, and by default it shares thousands and thousands of files, including documents. Um, I think it's important to point out um, what Mr. Sindor didn't state, which is, and again, this is, this is I, I'm assuming that this is the same thing that was in his, um, his written report, that in order to achieve the result that Mr. Sindor just described, what he had to do was install a version of LimeWire on a computer, turn off all of the um, security settings that prohibit document sharing, which again, goes, it takes, you know, that single step in itself, um, nine clicks and three warnings, proactively go and share thousands and thousands and thousands of files. Um, so he basically sets up a program for the most, you know, dangerous possible situation. He then uninstalls LimeWire from his computer, um, which uninstalls the program but does leave settings as is common industry practice for, I mean, this is what's done by Microsoft, by Apple, by Google. This, this is how settings are generally kept when programs are uninstalled. He then then goes through the steps that he refers in his testimony where he um, installs a new version of the program, and which then has its problem. But at, at some point, I mean, a user who affirmatively goes and sets up his computer and disregards so many wanted to share, at, at some point, you know, people do actually wish to share files. I mean, it's not that all sharing is inadvertent sharing. And I would just like to point that out as, as just one example of the, the methodological tricks that Mr. Cinder plays in, in, his, um, in, in his reports. And I just would encourage you to be careful and, and look very hard at his statements. Because I read his report, and I was sort of shocked at first until I started parsing the words. And it, it's, it's a very cleverly worded report, but I don't find it to be very accurate. Mr. Sidno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
uh, 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 to frame what Mr. Gordon just said in a slightly different way, what I did, what is exactly what the uh, Bucci family uh, 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 profiled in uh, the Today Investigates report on in, uh, inadvertent file sharing back in uh, 2009 did, uh, what happened is their daughter has installed a version of uh, LimeWire on the family computer, misconfigured it. Next thing you know, the, te the family is, a, the vic uh, is inadvertently sharing tax return, becomes a victim of identity theft, uh, an identity thief steals their tax returns, and then the uh, Bucci family did exactly what you would think a normal person would do, and they discovered that type of problem. They uninstalled the program. That's exactly what I did in my test setup. I set up a, a, a version of LimeWire, created inadvertent file sharing, and then to correct it, uninstalled it, just the way an ordinary consumer might do. In other words, the hypothetical that I presented to the committee is not at all hypothetical for the Bucci family or thousands of other, fa or probably hundreds of thousands of other families and computer users who have uninstalled some version of LimeWire 5. Mr. Gordon is asking you to accept the proposition that if somebody removes his program from their computer, that indicates their desire at some point in the future to restart all the, you know, all the, all the uh, sharing that it might have been causing, and that assumption simply does not accord to reality. The difference between Mr. Gordon's account of how his book program behaves and my report is I try to look at how ordinary people would actually be using this program. Mr. Gordon is talking to you about ideal situations. Yes, if you install his program on a computer um, that is uh, th that you know no third party has ever had access and you t to and you know that you uh, have never ever installed any version of LimeWire even years earlier uh, it will not share files by default but that is not the ordinary situation for an ordinary family computer certainly not situation with mine right. And certainly not situation for your constituents. Thank no, you. No, 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 I'm going to ask you some questions now because my time is about to expire on me. Um, Mr. Gordon, the testimony we heard this morning demonstrates that there are still major problems with the most recent version of your software. By default, it shares downloaded files. By default, it shares images, music, and videos that may have been inadvertently shared in previous versions of LimeWire. And it leaves me behind hidden files when a user attempts to completely remove the software from their computer. Why haven't you fixed these problems? And when will you fix the problems? If um, so, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Let, let me just quickly um, address Mr. Sindor's most recent But my comments. time is expiring on uh, me, you know. Uh, 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 I, I'm sorry, but, but so, so the example where he just gave talking about the Bucci family where the daughter, w w you know, accidentally was set things up to share files. Um, so I, I strongly suspect that, in, that that probably happened with a version of LimeWire 4, not LimeWire 5. And if someone now goes and installs, a, if there was an old version of LimeWire 4, it was uninstalled. If it is that, that is now reinstalled, um, if someone installs a version of LimeWire 5, it automatically unshares all documents, including tax returns. And it also, before any sharing, and again, this is even sharing if, if you upgrade from a, uh, a version of uh, LimeWire 5 to a new version of LimeWire 5, um, it, it puts up a warning that says, Are you, do you want to share these? It makes you very conscious of, the, of, of these things. We're, we're, I, we're, we've, done, we've worked very hard to try and bring all of these issues up to the front, so make it very transparent to users. Fine. I, I'm, I'm, I'd ask unanimous uh, consent, yeah. Mr. Chairman, for you to have such time as it may be necessary for him to answer your question. Okay, Thank you very okay, much. I'm sorry. Thank so, you, so gentlemen, yeah, because we try to run this committee okay, by rules. Okay, so, all right, so I'm, I'm sorry, uh, would you mind repeating the question just so I <laughs> I'd be delighted to. Uh, by default, it, first of all, let me go back. The testimony we heard this morning demonstrates there are still major problems that will with the most recent versions of your software. By default, it shares downloaded files. By default, it shares images, music, and videos that may have been inadvertently shared in previous versions of LimeWire. And it leaves behind hidden files when a user attempts to completely remove the software from their computer. My question is, why haven't you fixed these problems? And I guess the second part will be, uh, being you haven't fixed them, when will you fix them? 
Um, so I think, as I just said, I, I believe most of the problems that, that you're, you're talking about, we, we actually have already fixed. Um, again, I, I would caution you to be just very careful of taking the, the testimony that you hear um, literally. And I, I would um, encourage you to, to, you know, go through the steps that Mr. Sindor You saw the demonstration. Uh, oh, uh, uh, yes. So uh, I am not saying that um, inadvertent file sharing does not happen in this world. What I'm saying is that the current, that the, the sorts of things that, you, that you're seeing would be very unlikely to happen with a current version of LimeWire. There are hundreds of file sharing applications in the world. And there are dozens of different file sharing applications which, are, which LimeWire is capable of searching. So the fact that you are seeing um, tax returns and other documents that were shared inadvertently does not mean that they're coming from a new version of LimeWire. I, I, I will say that there are probably many of those documents that are coming from old versions of LimeWire, and I would encourage you know, all um, people in the world who are running old versions of LimeWire to upgrade to the new versions to address these problems. Unfortunately, you know, we, we've done our best to try to communicate to people to upgrade to the new versions, but and, you know, I mean, we, there are certain things that we, you know, we have not been able to persuade everyone to do that. You know, Mr. Gordon, you know, reading back over your testimony in the last time, you know, you're basically saying the same thing you said then. You know, I just want to let you know that. I now yield to the, the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gordon, you, uh, you said you were a technologist in your statement. Some would say I'm an old technologist, so bear with me. Do you know who Peter Norton is? Um, of Norton Ant Ant Antivirus? Yes. I've heard of him. I go back to when he was just Peter. Okay. That's how old I am. What was, the, what was his goal in his product from what you can look at, Norton Antivirus? Wasn't it to protect customers from losses, from damage to their computers? And didn't he create a whole industry to do it? It's semantics now, but, you know, isn't that the history? I believe so. Are your customers less important than his customers to you? No. Do you try to protect your customers? Yes, we do. Okay, then let's go through some steps. Why is it you still have 4.18 on your site? You still offer today for download out-of-date software that's inherently more vulnerable by your own statements. Why do you still do that? Uh, I'm not aware of us doing that. And My own people who are not technologists checked on it today still there. Now, let's go through some of the, you, you talked about de facto standards and standards, and you quoted Microsoft. I'll leave Microsoft out of it for a moment. When I uninstall your product, do you provide an uninstall care, uh, capability? Yes. So you don't rely on a default of Microsoft. You, you control the uninstall. Isn't it true that when you uninstall with your own software, your software programmers, your technologists could, in fact, move those switches back or allow the customer to, to make that decision? Isn't that something you could easily write into the code? Yes. Okay. So you still have the old software. You have an uninstall routine that does not, in fact, re-protect or offer an opportunity to re-protect the customer. Isn't that true? At least as of so, today. So when you reinstall, if you, if you, so document sharing is turned off by default on, in LimeWire 5. No, no. I've got LimeWire Lime 4. Lime, four when, hold when on you for a second. Hold yes. on for a second. I've got LimeWire 4.18. Yes. I update to LimeWire Lime uh, 5.28. Yes. I go to uninstall. Does your software give me the opportunity to fully protect, to take those items which I had maybe chosen, such as, uh, I noticed that, by the way, MP3, MPEG, and so are not on this list, but DOC, WRI, DVI, LaTeX, and so on, those are ones I may have chosen to turn on or not. Do you, in fact, in your uninstall, provide the reprotection, or do you leave it sort of switched as it was? So if you have a version, Lime, uh, LimeWire 4, and you upgrade or I've install, already upgraded. Oh, you, I'm you, talking uh, about your current version. When no, I uninstall so, and then you your install, current and, version. And you install the current version, it automatically will unshare documents that were previously right. shared. Right, but now I've chosen to share them. Now I'm uninstalling the software. Do you, does your software allow me to un, unshare them at the time that I'm uninstalling? No. You're in control of that, right? This is not a Microsoft the, standard. You're in control of that decision. 
That's true. But when you okay, so I think we've kind of come through some of the things you could do, and I'm not saying you must do them all. I'm saying you could do them. You're not doing them for your customer. Now, you uh, you're not forcing people to upgrade to LimeWire 5. We have no mechanism to do that. Oh, you don't? Wouldn't it be relatively simple as an old software guy to a younger software guy? You could, in fact, create the capability that LimeWire 4 users would simply, when they try to, they try to share, they would see that they're blocked from sharing with LimeWire 5.2 and above unless they upgrade. That wouldn't be hard for you to do. LimeWire 5.2 could, could deliberately be incompatible with LimeWire 4.1. You could create, in fact, a block on that. That's, that's software doable, isn't it? So, yeah, we could, we could okay, break so you, compatibility So, in fact, if it. you care about your customers and you know that LimeWire 5 is much better than LimeWire, LimeWire 5.2.8 that just came out, is, in fact, better protection for your customers and you wanted to protect your customers, the, one of the easiest ways to protect your customers is, in fact, to force out the older generation software, something which, since you write the software, you're in control of doing. I spent 20 years in, in auto security. I think about security, and I think about what can I do for my customers. I also think about how to make car alarms not go off. It's, it's, the, it's the hard part. Making them go off was easy. It sounds like sharing, which is easy, is what you do. Protecting for your customer these simple questions, and I could go on for a lot longer with questions, and any consultant you hire could help you with those. If you were thinking in terms of security, you'd have asked and answered those questions for your customers. Anyone can make a car alarm that goes off all night. It's hard to make one that doesn't go off except when someone's stealing your car. Anyone can make file sharing easy. What are you doing to protect your customers so that file sharing is not something that leads to these inadvertent acts for them or others? Um, so, I mean, we, we've taken a large number of steps, which I've documented in a, um, my but I, I appreciate but, that, but, but, but I you also, don't, you don't, so, so you don't many, get credit for what you, you, you can't answer today no, that was so, that simple, do so they? Many, you know, many of the steps that we've taken have come from outside suggestions. And we'd be happy to look at any suggestions that you have or anyone else has as to how we can improve our program. We've taken a large number of steps. steps. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect, and we would be happy to look at anything and continue to work going forward to get as close to perfect as we can get. I appreciate that. My time for new questions has expired. If the other two gentlemen would just comment on the line of questioning I explored, please. Uh, Rank Member Rice, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think that is exactly correct. The, 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 um, the, the problem, I think, if you, you can see in, in, that you have illustrated that I, I think you can see um, uh, live here is Mr. Gordon's uh, basic has made some improvements, but um, it, it, he made improvements that relate to types of documents that don't actually drive a lot of traffic towards the Nutella network. So it, whenever you see somebody who's inadvertently sharing document files, sensitive personal documents, what, in my experience, actually looking at what happens on Mr. Gordon's network, something that LimeWire itself really does not do much of, uh, it shows that whenever you, that is happening, they are sharing many other types of files. Uh, and I, I illustrated the dangers of that in my uh, 2007 testimony, basically pointing out that actually, if, I, if that happened to my family, yes, the document files would be important to me. The most dangerous files, in terms of identity theft and the safety of my children, would actually be the image files. Those would be the most dangerous. I laid that out in my 2007 testimony, and lest anyone think that I was wrong, uh, I'll just quote some testimony from Mr. Boback. Tyversa has documented cases where child pornographers and predators are actively searching P2P networks for personal photos of children and others that are stored on private computers. Once the photos are downloaded and viewed, these individuals use the browse host function provided um, uh, to view and download all additional information being shared from that computer. Mr. The changes Mr. Gordon's program makes don't solve that problem. They don't share the mass copy, solve the massive copyright infringement problem. They're half measures. My only comment is that uh, LimeWire has made changes in, in the time since our last testimony. However, uh, uh, you know, and from our oversight view of that, um, they have lost market share since that time. Users have transitioned to other places, uh, other, other clients, as LimeWire has made the changes. Our own personal uh, concern with this, with LimeWire 5.0 and up, 
is that for some unexplained reason, uh, Tyversa, which is the only oversight to any peer-to-peer -peer client of the number of them, was hard-coded in a block so that we would be unable to see every user of 5.0 and up. Now, we don't interfere with the network at all. We don't touch LimeWire clients. We don't stop downloads. We have never taken a dollar from the Motion Picture Association or the recording industry. However, for some reason, our entire IP address range that Tyversa uses to monitor has been hard-coded, which means someone literally typed into the LimeWire code, do not ever connect to anyone associated with Tyversa, which we still, I've posed a question to the CEO of LimeWire, and I still have yet to have a response. Right. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to uh, include in the record at this time from 7.28.09 the screenshots of in HTML format showing the uh, previous versions of LimeWire that were available as of that date so that that can be included in the record. Uh, and I might also that mention... That objection is so ordered. Mr. Chairman, it, it is interesting that Mr. Gorton uh, was so livid in saying that ISPs could protect and then in fact shows that he can, he can protect from a specific range of a particular ISP. That is interesting. And I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. You know, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to all of this, and um, I'm trying to figure out, I heard what uh, Mr. Issa said from the beginning, and he said that if we were to find certain things happening here, this is something that should be reported to, referred to the Justice Department. After seeing what Mr. Bobak presented here a moment ago, it is chilling what is now, what the public now has available to it. The idea that you can look at the First Lady's uh, information, figure out where she's going, how she's getting there, and so forth and so on, tax records, things of that nature of people. Um, and some kind of way, we've got to get to the bottom of this. And perhaps the best way to get there is to, and I've, I've been sitting here listening to you, Mr. Gordon, trying to s figure out whether you have sincerely done everything you can to protect the uh, American people with regard to, to this kind of uh, information being put out there. But now I'm going to pick up right where we left off with Mr. Bobak, what you just said. Why did Lamar, Mr. G Gordon, block Tyversa from access to his portals after assuring the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, this committee, that it was uh, fully committed to correcting the inadvertent file sharing troubles to which it had contributed. First of all, is what he just said true? Did you all block them, Tyversa? Uh, I, I don't have any specific knowledge of that, so I, I can't say. So you, w w wait, wait, whoa, whoa. So you're, you're saying you don't know whether it happened? That's correct. Okay, go ahead. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about what LimeWire does to, to fight spam. So again, now we're getting into a little bit of the um, sort of technical details of the way peer-to-peer -peer networks work. Um, but peer-to-peer -peer networks are distributed. And what that means is that each of the um, computers on that network are connected to each other through sort of a, a, a chain effect. And messages and searches are conducted as messages are passed from one computer to the next. There are um, certain people and, um, you know, and computers in this world who are spammers who respond to every search that's done on LimeWire that with all sorts of messages and things like that. Mr. And, Gordon, I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to cut you off. And the only reason I'm going to cut you off is I don't have that much time. They only give us five minutes. But okay. Let, let, me just, let me just ask this of you, Mr. Bobak. I'm going to come back to you if I have time. Do you think he's doing all that he can to address the problems that you showed us in the demonstration? And what else could he do? Because that's what my constituents want to know. Tonight I'm going to have a town hall meeting over the phone. And, I mean, if people saw this and we've got this new piece about electro, you know, digital records and all that, people are going to say, wait a minute, hold it. The fact that I've got cancer or, you know, the fact that my, my, my whole IRS, all my records are out there in cyberspace, I mean, I mean, has he done 
all that he could have done, in your opinion? And, and, and were you blocked from helping him? Um, in, in my opinion, no, they have not done everything that they could possibly do. Uh, we provided an option after the 2007 hearing that uh, we were willing to work with them to say, look, we see some obvious solutions of how you can do this. Rather than just blocking at the ISP, there are a number of things you can do. Um, those conversations ceased shortly thereafter. Um, and then six months after that, we were blocked. And we are not a spammer. We don't respond to searches. So I, we are absolutely passive on the network. When our system gets a search, it passes it right on through without changing the search, without downloading it, without, without doing anything. We are absolutely passive on the network. We don't block a single file. We don't spam advertising. We don't do $1 in advertising. So therefore, we are not a spammer. And we are, in fact, blocked as of March 2008. They blocked us six months after they ceased discussions as to the solutions that we offered. Mr. Gordon, back on 2000, J July 24, 2007, you said um, you had no idea there was that amount of classified information out there and that there are people actively looking for that and looking for credit and inf card information. Uh, is this shocking to you and does it bother you that this information is out there like that? Absolutely. And, and what, so you're going to promise us some more today of things you're going to do? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I can promise you our ongoing commitment to continue working on this problem. I will say that I think we have done, we have made enormous strides in the past two years, and that certainly, you know, the vast, vast, vast majority of inadvertent file sharing with LimeWire has been eliminated in the new versions, and we are happy to continue working um, going forward to do whatever we can do. Because, I mean, you know, we, we take our responsibility to our users very seriously, we don't want anyone to have an unpleasant experience in any way from using LimeWire. And I can certainly see if someone has their, their tax records um, revealed publicly, that that's a pretty serious thing. And we take this seriously, and that's why we put in so much effort. We're, I mean, we're a small company. A good fraction of the programming resources of our entire company has gone to combating this problem, and I think we've made very good progress. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Maryland, I now yield to the gentleman from uh, uh, New Hampshire, Mr. Hodes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for your testimony. Um, Mr. Gordon, I find your testimony today stunning. Uh, you promised us two years ago that you were going to fix what ails LimeWire. And your testimony today basically um, for me is uh, essentially, why are you picking on me? There are others out there who are facilitating breaches of national security, who are facilitating the commission of child sex crimes, who are facilitating the theft of property from musicians uh, and owners of copyright, and who are facilitating identity theft. Uh, Mr. Bobak, Mr. Gordon testified essentially that using a recent version of LimeWire, you couldn't engage in the kind of activity that you highlighted by showing us in real time what was going on. He then modified that testimony when asked a question uh, by the chairman to say it was very unlikely to happen. Are either of those statements true? It is. He's correct in saying that it's less likely in, um, on LimeWire than it is in some other peer-to-peer -peer clients. However, those, all of the demonstrations that we showed here today were, li were in fact, LimeWire disclosures, so occurring from a LimeWire client. I could have shown BearShare and other disclosures as well, but we specifically have LimeWire. So and, and were you using current versions of LimeWire to do the demonstration today? The tax return video was actually a 418 version of LimeWire. Um, but it accessed information that was out there. What I have found is that most of the users don't want to upgrade to 5.0 because it further decreases their access to other information. So therefore, they don't want to do it. Mr. Gordon, uh, you've heard about the incident in which the uh, blueprints for um, Marine One, the presidential helicopter, ended up in Iran? Yes. Um, did anyone in your organization attempt to remove that file or take any other action when you heard about that? Um, we have no mechanism to remove files from people's personal computers. 
Did you do anything to block uh, access to that information in any way? Uh, again, the, the Nutella network is a decentralized network which LimeWire doesn't run. So again, we, you know, I think maybe an analogy using an internet browser is, is perhaps a, a, a analogous that. Let me ask you this question. When you heard about the plans for Marine One, the presidential helicopter ending up in Iran, did you take any action at all? Yes or no? Yes. What did you do? I mean, so the, we have made changes to the current version of LimeWire, so that's such a breach would not happen today. Uh, is there any file of information you would try to have removed if it was brought to your attention? For example, if you heard or found there was a file um, containing directions for making an IED that could harm our soldiers in Iraq or Afghanistan, anything you would do? Uh, again, I, I think those files should be removed from the network, but again, LimeWire does not control the computers of people around the country. How about child pornography? If you were made aware that uh, you, uh, you're, uh, you, you understand that LimeWire is being used as we speak to facilitate the commission of child sex crimes. You understand that, right? Yes. What are you going to do about it? LimeWire is in the process of working with the New York State Attorney General's Office on specifically this problem. And we in conjunction with the New York State Attorney General's Office, are building a filter to remove child pornographic material. Why didn't you do that two years ago? Uh, again, we, we do not have a list. Of Why the, didn't you build the filter you were just telling me about two years ago when you came before this committee, we talked about the problem, and you promised us you'd fix it? Why didn't you do it two years ago? Answer my question. Uh, again, I'm, I'm pointing out that in order to solve the problem which you are describing, you need to know which material is child pornographic material. And LimeWire by itself does not have that knowledge. So we have had to work with outside third parties in order to gain knowledge of what that material is. There, there are certain organizations in, this, in, the, in the world whose job it is to maintain lists of that material, and LimeWire is in the process of working with them in order to filter that material from the network. Did you start two years ago when you promised us you were going to fix the problem? Um, yes I, or no? Just a simple yes or no, uh, Mr. I, I, I don't know the date we started working on this. So you can't tell us that after leaving this committee room two years ago when you promised us you'd fix it, you started fixing it, right? Uh, I know that it is an ongoing effort that we are working on today. And Thank that you, we Thank hope you. To resolve my time it soon. Thank you, Mr. Hose. Mr. Foster, you're recognized for five minutes. Yeah, no, the, the hidden files that, that persist as you update, um, are these things files, registry entries, or are hidden files? What's the exact nature of these? Is there anything special about them? Um, I, I, I have to say that I'm not, you know, 100 percent sure, but I believe that they're regular files, and I, I believe when they're called hidden, they are by no means obscured from the user, and if you were to go look in the directory, you would see the, the preference files. They're, they're not invisible in any way except that people don't normally choose to examine them. Right, okay, and it, it, so now you're staying. So, yeah. Mr. Mr. Uh, Representative Foster, can I correct the record on this? Um, certainly. Uh, that is simply false. Uh, I am familiar with the nature of the files. I, I've looked at them. Uh, they are stored in a place where users never go in a hidden folder. It is invisible to the ordinary user, yes, if they, um, uh, dehide that folder, they could conceivably find it, but by default, that folder is invisible. Uh, and if you can't find that folder, you can't find the files in it. Simple as that. Right. Uh, but th this is a standard industry practice to um, hold, you know, things like which could be a registry entries or detailed settings. Not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, LimeWire leaves an enormous amount of material behind when it installs, and I'm simply not aware. I, I just don't believe it is uh, accurate. When Mr. Gordon claims that, that companies like LimeWire and, and Microsoft and Google do this, I do not believe that they are leave behind the types of configuration files that could have dangerous effects 
if they are reactivated by another version of the program that chooses not to overwrite them. Yeah, um, not true. Uh, Mr. Gordon, your statement that you can't force an update, um, you know, when this sort of problem occurs, is that a feature of your most recent software as well? So our, our current um, software does have update capabilities, but the old LimeWire for something, for, I, I don't know exactly at what point, you could, but there are old versions in which we are not able to send an update message. Okay. Um, now, I guess this would be best directed to Mr. Bobak. Um, you know, the, the nuclear option here is to block the new teleprotocol, you know, at the very high level um, internet router level. That, you know, if this really becomes intolerable, if you start seeing nuclear weapons designs out on, the, on this thing and it becomes important to do, the, and, and the obvious risks there are free speech risks, because I personally don't see any, any mechanism and set of technologies that would allow you to block child pornography that would not allow you to shut down Falun Gong. And this is a, you know, this is the, the tough situation we're in. Um, okay, but now, are there, okay, first off, um, businesses, however, can choose to block the Nutella protocol. A hospital, for example, could just say, we don't want any file sharing on our computers. Many businesses, I believe, do. National laboratories, I believe, do block file sharing protocols. Is that consistent with your experience? All of our clients block peer-to-peer uh, -peer applications from being downloaded. The problem is, is that, um, people work around those because they want music, for one. Uh, I will tell you that all of our clients of the Fortune 500, they have all had disclosures on peer-to-peer -peer despite the, um, the recommendations for them to avoid that. In fact, we even found the rules and regulations for IT security saying to block peer-to-peer -peer on a large Fortune 100 right, company. These come from people bringing their computers and files home to places where they're not protected. So at least at right. the workplace, there's a simple thing to just... Just you know, wipe out the new new tele protocol. For the most Does, part. Similarly, the military do they block all peer-to-peer -peer connections on the military networks? I believe that the military does discourage the use of peer-to-peer. -peer. However, being a d dispersed group, there's no way to stop it entirely. It's it's like stopping crime. You, you have to monitor it, and that's that's what we've chosen to do. Okay, but on the military subnets, they can presumably yes. just block it. And do you have, do you know for a fact whether they do or do not? I, I do not know for a fact. Okay. Um, now, Mr. Gordon, the, it seems to me that the, the sensible solution to this, instead of having an exclusive, an inclusive list, list, or sorry, an exclusive list, a list of things that we're not going to share, is if the user had to say, yes, I want to share this file, click on it, and have to march through every single file and explicitly say, yes, this file, I recognize it, yes, instead of just clicking on the whole C drive and going, wow. Well, that, okay. th what you described is the current practice with, with LimeR. You have to affirmatively select each every file. Single or, file or, or including everything you download? Downloaded files, um, I believe, on installation, you have a choice whether you want to automatically reshare or, or not reshare files that you download. Okay. Um, and, and then this question of, of trying to recall old versions of it. Um, it that, that is my understanding that would be essentially impossible because the Nutella protocol is a multi-vendor open protocol. There's no way that you can stop those old versions from working. Is yes, that, I mean correct? it's a piece of software on a person's individual computer, right. and they control. So the it. only the only way to to stop old versions from working would be for, for example, you know, basically the whole world to block the old Nutella protocol, re-implement a Nutella protocol where you actually had control over who gets to write clients and what the procedures are on on that. That that would be a, to me the only the solution that would allow you to actually flush out the the problems with the current system. Otherwise, you'd be forced with the old Nutella protocol doing whatever bad features with whatever bad old versions of the software out there. Are you aware of any other way that we can flush out the old versions of the software? I mean, it's, it's certainly very difficult because, again, the, those versions of LimeWire don't just connect to the new versions of LimeWire. They connect to dozens of other P2P clients right, that are... Which, so. which could only be shut down by a worldwide effort okay, but it, to, yeah. to block them and then re-implement a new version that didn't have these problems. All right, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Mr. Connolly, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gordon, um, Mr. Sidnor uh, sort of laid out three broad critiques of uh, LimeWire, and I wonder if you'd respond. The first was that it's dangerously unpredictable, that in installing the software, his experience was uh, that just on, by default, 16,798 documents showed up 
inadvertent uh, display. Could you comment? Yeah. Uh, is I mean, your software dangerously unpredictable I, from your I point of view? I do not believe so. So, again, I think it's worth. I couldn't hear you. What? Uh, it, I do not believe it is dangerously unpredictable. Um, and, again, I think it's worth talking about the, the situation. So, in order to get the result that Mr. Sidnor described, he had to install a version of a, a new version of LimeWire or a, a version of LimeWire 5.0 or greater, disable all the security features that are, that are built into it over the, you know, disregard many, many, many warnings and affirmatively choose to share thousands of files. Then he had to uninstall that version of LimeWire and install a new version of LimeWire. So, I mean, again, there has been a lot of discussion here. Uh, and, and then once that new version of LimeWire was installed, so, there would be warnings that would pop up yeah, that would me, ask him Forgive me for interrupting, but because we have limited time here, I, wanna, I just want to get at the essence of your answer. I get it. So your view is he's the one who's dangerously unpredictable, not your software. I'm not sure I would characterize him that way. I just well, but you, you just went through all the steps he had to take that made him dangerously unpredictable. Um, is it your contention that, that if we directed our committee staff to do what Mr. Sidnor did, we would or would not come up with the same results here at the committee? I mean, if you got a version of LimeWire 5, Dis, you know, if you then removed all the security settings, over, you know, ignored all the warnings, chose to share files, then uninstalled that program and, and, and installed a new upgraded version, you would still be presented with warnings, which you could then ignore. So it, it is, I mean, LimeWire is file sharing software. People, it's not unreasonable to think that people who install file sharing software might actually want to share files. What we try and do is make it so that the files they share are only files they want to share. Mr. Chairman, uh, I may be a freshman, but the light has stayed on red. That's because you're a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> so you gave the answer and the question in the same breath. <laughs> I thank the chair. Uh, Mr. Sidnor also said that in addition to it being dangerously unpredictable, one of his three points was you were knowingly dangerously unpredictable. In other words, this isn't accidental. This isn't just a feature of the software that's something we can't really control. You knowingly have, in fact, manufactured, sold, upgraded software that uh, uh, has this dangerous default with what he uh, characterized as devastating results, quote, unquote. I assume you, your view is that's just not true. That, that is absolutely untrue. I mean, I can tell you that we take this problem seriously. We are actively working to resolve it. Um, I, I will say that there are situations which can occur in the world which didn't occur to us in testing involving, you know, weird combinations of in, installing old software and new software. And as these edge cases come up and they're pointed out to us, we address each one as it comes along. I would like to think that we have caught every last problem, uh, that's probably not true. But as they're pointed out to us, we go and take the steps that are necessary to ensure that those problems don't continue. Huh. And, and the third point he made was that he could identify at least eight violations of voluntary best practices, suggesting that self-regulation in your case doesn't work. Um, I, uh, again, he did not say what those violations were. I believe, I mean, so this is coming from his paper, which uh, my recall of the, the specifics is not, is not perfect. But um, I believe that m many of those claims about those, uh, us disregarding those, those, those um, eight best practices are false. I think he may have pointed out an issue or two, which we have since resolved, and I believe that all eight issues which he discussed before are, are currently non-existent. Well, the red light, Mr. Connolly, has truly come on now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That, that we appreciate your, your questions and thank you for them. Uh, Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, very much. And uh, Mr. is it uh, Mr. Bobick or Bobick? Bobic. What? Bobak. Bobak. I was, uh, I was interested to read in the briefing paper that uh, your company did a demonstration and you uh, 
In January of 2009, it says that Tiversa was able to locate and download more than 275,000 tax returns. Is that accurate? That's accurate, yes, sir. Can you, uh, <clears throat> do you feel that you basically can, can get any, anybody's tax return that you want to? Surprisingly, we can get a great deal of information, yes, sir. I don't know about anyone, but most people. And, you know, I, I, when, when, uh, when all of us, when we uh, run for Congress, we basically uh, forfeit or give up any right to privacy, and we sort of have to accept that. But don't you think it's, it, it, do you think there's any real privacy in this country anymore if, if anybody can uh, get almost anybody's tax return or medical records or bank records or anything else that they want to get? It's definitely uh, been depleted quite a bit with this with this a application. Yes. It seems. It, 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 I mean, I I know that we've taught all the young people to uh, worship the computers now and so forth and and become addicted to them. But uh, it seems to me that it's sad that uh, we're so controlled now that there that we've basically done away with almost any privacy that. Uh, uh, that private citizens should have in this uh, country. L uh, how, uh, how skilled a computer user does uh, uh, one need to be to hack into uh, files that are not intended to be shared? It's as simple as doing a, a Google search. Literally, you would type in tax return and hit search. That's, that's what I thought you'd say. In fact, uh, several years ago, I was uh, driving back from lunch in Knoxville one day and I heard on the CBS radio national news that uh, computer hackers had hacked into the uh, top secret files of the Pentagon that year uh, and it was many thousands of times I don't remember exactly how many and then I remember a few years ago when uh, the front page of the Washington Post they had a story about a 12 year old boy uh, hundreds of miles away from the Hoover Dam had opened the floodgates at the Hoover Dam. And, so, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, I suppose in one way that's funny, but in another way it's pretty uh, sad and it's also pretty uh, uh, dangerous, it seems to me, to our national security. At any rate, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. We appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Goyne, I, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, you said that you, you personally knew nothing about uh, the fact that Mr. Bobak's uh, system had been shut out of your, uh, your software, I guess, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, so will you reinstate it now? Will you, will you remove that barrier? Um, we, we can certainly talk to Mr. Bobak. Um, what would that discussion involve? So as I, as I was saying before, um, LimeWire has, has a system for identifying spammers. And then do you consider Mr. Bobak's group a spammer? I, I do not. Okay, but so it, what else do you have? What, what, is going well, to be but, but it may be that there, there is something about the profile of the way his systems behave that matched our identification for spammer. We can try and work with Mr. Bobak to make sure that he is not falsely identified as a well, spammer. Well, why did you break off the conversations with him? I assume those would be the type of things you would have discussed with him after the last hearing. Uh, well, and then uh, Mr. Bobak says you were working along and, and you stopped the discussion. So I believe the conversations he was referring to was his attempt to get LimeWire to purchase and distribute the software which he is um, selling and the service which he is selling. And it was our preference that rather than he, – he has a system which flags – um, I know it is security, security. Mr. Gordon, but I, and, I and so it was our preference with LimeWire rather than to create a system which identified security problems. We would we would rather eliminate them, okay. and we felt that if we did a proper job eliminating um, inadvertent file sharing, there would not be a need for Mr. Right. Bobek's so software. So set aside whether you want to buy his services or anything of that nature. Why would you block him? So so this is what I was saying. So we have an automated system which goes and looks for spammers. And I believe that his um, company's systems in some way has a profile of a spammer and they were, um, they were you know, inadvertently flagged as a, as a spammer. Does so that make sense to you, Mr. Sidner? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, none whatsoever. Tiversa Service has been operating. Uh, I mean, I, I, I 
first encountered them some years ago when I began investigating this problem, it's been operating for years. If it would triggered some automatic spam filter, uh, it should have done so years ago. Uh, it, you know, the timing would suggest that right after the last big round of very significant disclosures about very significant uh, episodes of inadvertent file sharing involving LimeWire, which Tyversa did help, as I recall correctly, um, uh, the uh, reporters and the, the military identify, that is when the block occurred. Interesting timing for an automated span detection system. Uh, Mr. Gordon, can I tell you that's how it looks from here? I mean, uh, so disabuse us of that notion if you can. S certainly. I mean, well, first of all, let me start by saying that I think that systems like Mr. Bobax has a positive and constructive role to play in the world, and I have no desire to see them shut down. So, so who um, in your I mean, company so, do you think had that desire and then physically blocked them? Who I mean, like be? I said, it's, a, it's an automated system. No, 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 no. Let's back up a second. Yes. Somebody had to physically go in and block them out. So who in your company no, is in charge the, of doing that? Uh, uh, like I was saying, we have an automated system which identifies IP. There's no, there's no okay. human being involved. Uh, all right. We've heard that before. Thank you. What do you think of that, Mr. Sidna? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I simply don't think it's credible. Uh, I mean, again, the, the basic problem is why, you know, isn't, is, is I, I've, I've, I've known Mr. Bobak's company for years, worked with them for years, their, their, their service has, as so far as I know, operated relatively similarly. It simply does not make sense that right after the latest round of disclosures, that they somehow, for the first time, would have tripped the automatic spam filter. Now, uh, th that, is an in that is exactly the sort of very interesting question that I think a, a law enforcement agency could investigate. And if I could add one final point, it's that I realize there has been a bit of he said, she said between Mr. Uh, um, Gordon and I today about how his program actually behaves. Um, I, that is totally unnecessary. We are talking about the behavior of a computer program. It will do the same thing every time, and I am happy to come in and demonstrate uh, for the, uh, any member of the committee or the staff uh, exactly how I do my testing and draw my conclusions. Mr. Bobak, uh, do you want to add anything to that conversation? I think Mr. Gorton's credibility here is, is at risk, so I want to caution you to that. Well, it is, uh, it is clear that we are blocked. We don't spam. Uh, we are engaged in federal investigations, federal, state, and local investigations with law enforcement, and the mere fact of his blocking our technology is a direct uh, infringement on our ability to actually prosecute and work with federal law enforcement to address these issues. Uh, we don't spam. That was clear. And to, to say that it's automated is not accurate. There is no automated programming. There is no automated system that learns how to program. You can automate updates. You can automate a number of things. But literally, someone typed in that RIP range. There is no random, oh, it fits into your software code. That is hard coded into there, which means someone literally did it. I don't know who that was. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're recognized in five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gordon, you were here before and I asked a few questions. Uh, you indicated uh, in December of 2008 uh, that you were going to engage in a concerted effort to com uh, combat and eliminate inadvertent file sharing. Is that right? Yes. And you saw the results of the test this morning. Apparently, uh, using your service, we can get information about troop rosters, names, Social Security numbers in the U.S. Army. Is that anything you approve of? No. Uh, we can get through your site uh, information about uh, the First Lady safe house route from the Secret Service. Is that anything you approve of? Certainly not. Uh, and obviously you don't approve of uh, getting access to confidential information about motorcade routes? Exactly. So is it fair to say that whatever it is that you did to, quote, combat and eliminate inadvertent file sharing was a total incomplete and utter failure? No, I disagree with that statement. So. It was effective, and however effective it was, it did not successfully stop access to motorcade routes, First Lady safe house information, troop rosters. You agree? That's a fact. You know, so, Mr. So Chairman. If, if I may, again, you know, I, I think. I, I, yeah, I, actually, I actually think it's a bit of a joke. Um, and the joke may be on us if we don't get a little firmer about this. You've got a business model that basically is all about uh, denying intellectual property rights uh, to folks who create music, create movies, uh, and foster the uh, sharing of that without any 
a type of respect for the intellectual property rights of people. Uh, it has an overbroad application so that uh, anybody who wants to go on the website and get information about Marine One or wants to get information about the First Lady Safe House or troop rosters can get it. Uh, and your routine is to come in here and tell us you're, quote, doing everything you possibly can and profess concern, uh, but your concern doesn't extend to doing that which is effective uh, to stop the problem. So at a certain point, uh, reasonable people have to ask the question as to whether the efforts that you're taking are cosmetic, essentially about slow walking uh, so that you can uh, maintain the pretext that, uh, that uh, there is a solution. Uh, at a certain point, I think we have to ask in Congress uh, as to whether or not we're going to take what action is required to protect uh, confidential national security information, uh, protect uh, intellectual property, uh, or not. And Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, my hope, I mean, I, 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 we have another hearing and another hearing and another hearing after that. We're going to have the same story from Mr. Gordon, and then we're going to have another demonstration from Diversa uh, that shows us whatever he's done lately has failed. And uh, at a certain point, it may be appropriate for us to ask uh, folks from the FTC, folks from uh, 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 the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, maybe some state attorney generals who are concerned also about access to pornography uh, as to whether there's some legal action that should be taken in order to protect intellectual property, protect our kids from uh, pornography, and in, uh, in, a, in a sense, you protect classified medical information and uh, national security information. So I want to thank uh, Tversa, uh, you know, the old Gro Groucho Marx uh, uh, line, do we want to believe Mr. Gorton or our own two eyes? Uh, and I think your demonstration uh, makes it irrefutable that whatever actions LimeWire has taken uh, to supposedly deal with this inadvertent file sharing is a failure. Uh, and my conclusion is that they have no serious intention of being successful in stopping because the main agenda item is uh, providing access to uh, intellectual property to anybody who wants it without any kind of compensation. So I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gordon, uh, in light of the, this hard coding question that there isn't time to resolve here, will you ag agree to uh, answer questions we submit uh, and provide information as to the people who wrote the software who would directly know how uh, these IP range of numbers got in? Yes, we'd be happy to help the committee with that. I appreciate that. Uh, there was a, a question, a follow-up question that I'm, I, I want to understand. Uh, I asked earlier, and I thought I got an affirmative, that, uh, that you could, in fact, force users who, want, who were using 4.x but wanted access to your switches that you could, in fact, uh, put, uh, create a situation in which if they didn't upgrade to the 5 level, the new software, I guess it would be 5.2.9, could say, look, we only deal with... 5.0 and above or whatever, and then uh, Mr. Foster implied that the open format would, would deny you that. Can you respond on that and follow up? So it, I guess it is possible for us to come out with a new version of LimeWire that would not connect to other versions. However, again, with the decentralized network, you have a situation where we don't just connect to other LimeWires, so we might connect to some other um, new telecompatible program, which then itself connected to a four. Uh, so the so even if we ourselves deny the connections, the network itself would probably sure. still maintain them. Now, now following up, uh, I'm an old businessman, so I, uh, I I generally want to figure out where the money goes, and that helps me understand the business model. Or you ask the business model, where does the money go? Either way, how do you make your revenue? We sell LimeWire Pro. You you make it only on the software. That is correct. And would you sell more or less software if you better protected your customer, the installer of the product, uh, from inadvertent file sharing? I suspect we would sell more. So if, like Peter Norton, the name from the past uh, for us old folks, you know, the DOS 3.3 type people, if, in fact, you improved your product to have features that would reduce inadvertent file sharing, you'd actually sell more product. That is true. I believe we've done that, and I think your conclusion is probably true. 
Well, let me ask you a couple of follow -up, simple follow-up questions. Uh, would it be hard to create a browser so that the user can, can simply like the search engine, maybe even leveraging the Microsoft search engine or uh, Apple's, uh, see what, what files are presently shareable and unshareable, you know, red and black or whatever. Is there any reason you couldn't create an easy ability for someone to see the folders that are vulnerable and the files that are vulnerable? Well, I, I, we already have the functionality you're talking about with, um, you know, two different colors. We, we have a, um, you can click one button to see all the files that you're sharing. We, we do our best to make it transparent specifically what people are sharing because we want people to be able to check to make sure they're not sharing anything they don't want to share. And would you be able to build an engine that, uh, that allowed people to then, uh, you know, in mass do a better job of protecting files they want to protect? I'm, I guess I'm not really quite In other sure words, I'm, I'm looking at that. Can I quickly click a red file and make it a black file, do the whole subfolder? Th that functionality currently exists. Okay. Now, you protect uh, basically docs and some of their equivalents, uh, including HTML. Why don't you collect, uh, why didn't you include PSTs in that? Since that's unlikely, that output from a Microsoft Outlook file, that's, that's a kind of an unusual one to want to share, isn't it? I I'm not familiar with that particular file extension, but it is possible that there are file extensions in this world which should be on our um, documents list, which are not currently there, and we, and we can add them if, if, if there so, are. So again, going back to your model, you, you, would do, you would be more popular if you did a better job of protecting your customers, you say, but you've got a lot of files that you need to get to looking at and, and procedures to help protect them. Isn't that right? We, I mean, we currently do a lot of things to prevent inadvertent file sharing. Let me ask one question, though. People buy LimeWire in order to be part of a file sharing community, but isn't the attraction, the primary attraction of LimeWire, the fact that there's a tremendous amount of content, LimeWire-based content out there that they're quickly able to download, including MP3s, MPEGs, and other video and visual uh, documents or, you know, files. Yeah, I mean, so people download and install LimeWire primarily to share files and media files are, are popular. Okay, on so that list. let me ask the final closing question. If, in fact, you did a better job, although the individual customer would appreciate it, isn't your model then vulnerable that if you do a good job for me, when I go out to look, there's less out there. So without the propagation or the, the huge amount of interesting content, your product sells worse. So don't you have an interesting conflict in which it's clear you should be protecting your customers more, but then if you protect them and they all use the product, what ends up happening is more, less content is available, therefore the whole category is less desirable. Isn't that essentially your conundrum? I mean, so... Uh, again, you, I'm not that you benefit from a lot of good, meaty, juicy, shared material, and that, in fact, the failures in your software, your failure of your software to protect me, has more to do with the fact that you have to create this huge amount of content in order for your whole industry to do well. But I, I don't think there's a dichotomy the way you Th phrase it there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your indulgence. Yield back. That was the best one question we ever heard. You get the... Uh, at this time, I want to recognize uh, the chairman, Mr. Towns, for a brief statement, uh, and then I'll go to the remaining two people on the yeah, panel I have, who have questions. I have to, Mr. Uh, Towns. You have to leave, yes. Uh, let me just say, from what I've heard today, it is clear that private citizens, businesses, and the government continues to be victims of unintentional and illicit file sharing. At its best, with the proper safeguards in place, peer-to-peer -peer software has great potential. At its worst, it isn't peer-to-peer, -peer, it's predator to prey. For our sensitive government information, the risk is simply too great to ignore. I'm planning to introduce a bill to ban this type of insecure, open network, peer-to-peer -peer software, software from all government and contractor computers and networks. I plan to meet with the new chairman of the Federal Trade Commission to request that the FTC investigate whether inadequate safeguards on file sharing software such as LimeWire constitute an unfair trade practice. 
The administration should initiate a national campaign to educate consumers about the dangers involved with file sharing software. The FCC needs to look at this too. The file sharing software industry has shown it is unwilling or unable to ensure user safety. It is time to put a referee on the field and to begin to play by rules. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Ms. Norton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, when you see that there have been breaches of national security uh, through, through uh, what is only, in, in poli only politely called inadvertent file sharing, uh, the average American, I think, would be more, even more concerned about their personal security, especially medical files. Um, I can think of nothing more personal than medical information. I am with the President and people on both sides of the aisle who say that there will be lots of money saved if we could, in fact, uh, computerize these files so that uh, they could be shared. Um, getting beyond the, po the point of how much that would cost, and not to mention making them secure. Mr. Chairman, I recall, perhaps it was in my subcommittee, it, it probably was, that a number of hearings we had on computerizing the FEHB fields, P files, the files for federal employees, and I recall the unions were basically for it, and we, we always came up with, with, with terrible compunctions about the security of these files. Uh, in Mr. Mr. Boback, in your testimony, you apparently uh, spoke of records from a hospital that had been inadvertently shared. This would be every every person's nightmare when you talk about inadvertent sharing. They've already seen their personal records, their Social Security, <laughs> their their their, their uh, financial information get leaked. Um, uh, in the case that you, you reported, the, the records contain not only the patient's names, but their diagnoses and other sensitive information. Uh, how widespread do you believe uh, the leaking of such information to third parties is from hospitals and medical facilities, Mr. Bobak? It's extensive. As a matter of fact, uh, that specific file has been out for nearly 20 months, or excuse me, uh, 16 months now. Uh, on the peer-to-peer -peer networks and has been taken extensively. It's been uh, downloaded a number of times. So these individuals will be affected for years. In fact, they're not even, they aren't even aware that they're on the list at this point. They've never been, in, they've well, never that, been told. That's, that would be my next question. Um, they have been breached. Their files have been breached in the most terrible way. And the most sensitive information you have about a person is just out there in, 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 in the stratosphere. Are patients generally informed that their information is, has been leaked? 41 of the 50 states require breach notification. 41 of the 50. 41 of the 50. There, at this time, there is no national breach notification law. There should be, as patients travel across state lines for medical care, there needs to be a national uh, breach notification law. I believe there was one uh, proposed, H.R. 2221. Uh, that gives the FTC some oversight and uh, actually punishment if, if organizations do not identify these to their consumers. That, that should that, pass. That does seem to me, Mr. Chairman, to be minimally uh, necessary. Uh, but let me ask you this. I suppose you do know. You know, you can change your Social Security number, maybe. You can change. Uh, you, can, you can take your, your credit cards and get new ones. What in the world can you do if information that is true and will forever be true about your medical condition is is out there so now you know it what do you do you know at this point there's not much to do there are credit monitoring and identity theft that are trying to work towards protecting medical information companies like lifelock uh, they are trying to put these uh, procedures in place are they there yet no but identity theft is evolving so rapidly that I will assure you that it's not just a fifty dollar credit card loss or a, a nuisance to the consumer it will be very impactful to the consumer and the family in the upcoming years if this is not addressed immediately. This is out of control. Mr. Chairman, 41 of the 50 states already understand this. Uh, it does seem to me, uh, with what you've been able to find at this hearing, that we'd want to bring forward a bill to make sure that this is 
is done nationally, and I might say that when it comes to the FEHBB, our employees, federal employees here, until there is uh, some such software in place, I do not see how, particularly given our workforce, tends to be an older workforce, I do not see how we could take this very important step that everyone knows needs to be taken and computerize the records of federal employees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Mr. Bilbrey, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gordon, I think that historically we've basically felt that it's the obligation of the consumer to protect their own files, and that is part of the process that historically we've used. Basically, you have to at least move through the system and keep hitting, clicking to move those files across. What I'm really concerned about is history has proven that this is not just a consumer problem. Um, the SWIFT example where you had 300 people who were illegally in the country being accessed records and be able to use those records for illegal employment. Um, people being able to use these, this document for other issues that we don't even know about. National security could be one of them. I'm going to ask, I'm asking you because this issue is going to be addressed now not just on an individual's privacy issue but a national security issue. We need to be more proactive in making sure that this data is not out, you know, in the stratosphere. Are you ready to be more aggressive with your industry? Are you ready to be proactive working with this Congress at shutting down this opportunity to breach um, information systems that can be used as a threat to this country? Absolutely. I mean, we worked with this committee in the past, and I hope we have the chance to do so going forward. Well, my, my question to you, if you were going to legislate from the federal level, and I know this is counterintuitive for you to think about, but if you were going to legislate, what recommendations, what would you do to address this problem? Um, I, I touched on this earlier in my testimony. There are, there are a number of problems um, where um, computers can essentially break the law or have the, these um, security issues. The unique point of control for every computer is its ISP. From a legislative point of view, that is really the only practical place you can attack. Because if you have, let's say you have a child pornographer, if, a, if, that, if they're identified, and as Mr. Bobeck's software can easily identify, you know, in an automated way, many, many people very easily. If there was a quick and effective mechanism where his computer quickly routes a message to, the, uh, to an ISP, and maybe the child pornographer has cut off the internet, or to law enforcement where, I mean, again, you have to come up with, with reasonable procedures. You have to ask some hard questions like, under what circumstance do we cut a computer off from the internet? If he finds a document that has nuclear secrets, is that enough to shut the computer off first and then you go do an investigation after? These are hard questions that need to be answered. But in the first wave of regulations surrounding the internet, I think there was a lot of euphoria with the internet and there wasn't as clear an issue of what the negative consequences of some of these amazing technologies are. We have a clear idea now and I think, and again, in order to do this, you have to deal with the ISPs which are basically telecom companies and I'm sure you're aware they're politically, you know, quite powerful institutions, but I don't think that it is possible for this country to really wrestle these questions to the ground without having the ISPs play a constructive role in that. Look, we were all enamored, too, with computer trading and then placed restrictions on the application of that technology. <clears throat> My question really gets into the fact, and what I, I guess I would close with a challenge to you, is that this isn't just about, about the technology application by certain agencies or certain um, companies, but it's also a national protocol or procedure that tightens up and, and makes it, let's just say, more proactive at opening up your record files. We need a procedure. We need to be 
looking at having regulations on this. And I just ask you, um, and you don't have to answer, but the challenge to you is not to be obstructionist, but be proactive at saying, okay, we have this procedure now. We think this, this, and this, and this will make it harder or tougher for people to inadvertently um, transfer files and ba basically make them more responsible, more um, less user friendly at opening up the files, but will address the problem. And that challenge of balance, if you want this committee, you want Congress to do the right thing, then you've got to be willing to move from a historical position and be proactive, take the hit to some degree, inconvenience the consumer to some degree, but address the crisis in a manner that's less intrusive than what we would propose working from the regulatory side. Now, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilberry. Thank all of our witnesses for the testimony here today, for their time and their expertise. Uh, we do appreciate it. I'm sure the Chairman has uh, further intentions to follow up on this issue. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.